Welcome to Buffalo HealthCast, the official podcast of the University of Buffalo School of Public Health and Health Professions. We're your co-hosts, Skylar Lawson and Tia Palermo. In this podcast, we cover topics related to health equity in Buffalo, around the U.S., and globally. This season, we'll be talking about nutrition from a health equity perspective. You'll hear from community members, practitioners, researchers, students, and faculty on topics related to nutrition, including food security, food access, social protection to improve nutrition outcomes, food apartheid, culturally tailored nutrition interventions, and more in this season of Buffalo HealthCast. Hi there, my name is Sarah Mona Prisvilla. I'm in the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior, and today we're going to be interviewing Jacob Bleasdale, who is a fourth-year PhD student in the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior at the UB School of Public Health and Health Professions. So Jake, I'm just going to jump right in with some questions, if that's okay. I think it's important for us to hear a little bit about how you became interested in HIV prevention and treatment research. Yeah, absolutely. So historically and within present day, we know that the HIV epidemic has affected marginalized communities, particularly the queer community. Um, And as a member of the queer community, it was important to me when deciding on a career path that my work that I was doing was based in equity and justice and work towards providing better health for a particular group. Um, So working to end the HIV epidemic through research is what I decided to do. And that's how I came about with HIV prevention research. It also kind of just bridges my two interests. So my undergrads are in biomedical sciences and pharmacology and toxicology. My PhD is obviously in community health and health behavior. And HIV research combines both that biomedical and behavioral sciences and allows me to give a nice lens to the work that I'm doing, but also understand the full complexities of the epidemic itself. Great. Tell me a little bit more, though, about the difference between HIV prevention versus HIV treatment, because I understand those to be related, but not the same thing. So talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about HIV prevention, we're primarily thinking about um, people who are not living with HIV or HIV uninfected people and preventing them from getting HIV. So most of my work and the work that we do in our work and our research uh, really focuses on increasing HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or HIV PrEP uptake within uh, communities that are most at risk for HIV acquisition. So that includes uh, communities of color, men who have sex with men, gay and bisexual men. So really focusing on increasing PrEP uptake for those communities. Then on the other hand, you have HIV treatment, which includes really amplifying engagement across the HIV care continuum. So that includes um, making sure that people who are living with HIV receive a timely diagnosis, are um, engaged in care and then take their medication enough so that they are virally suppressed or the HIV in their body is so low it cannot be um, detected on a viral load test. So that's HIV uh, treatment research really focuses on bolstering and amplifying engagement across the care continuum and, and making sure that people who are living with HIV achieve and maintain viral suppression. That's great. Okay. So now I want to ask you a little bit more about nutrition, right? So this is a a different path, but how did you become interested in nutrition and food insecurity research? Yeah, absolutely. So my first exposure to nutrition and dietary and eating behavior work was in my undergrad. So I worked as a research assistant all throughout my undergrad in the Child Health and Behavior Lab in the Jacobs School of Medicine under the direction of Dr. Stephanie Ansman Frasca. And in this lab, I really learned a lot about developmental psychology and early childhood health behavior in relation to obesity prevention. So I focused a lot on nudging techniques and techniques that would make the healthiest choice the easiest choice for children to prevent obesity. And when I decided to pursue a PhD and really focus my work on HIV prevention and treatment, I really wasn't ready to give up the nutrition aspect of that yet. So I decided to look at how dietary intake and food insecurity would start to influence HIV treatment outcomes for those living with HIV. And that's kind of how I have been marrying the two within my work a little bit. I think food insecurity is a term that a lot of people use, but not everybody may understand what it means. So what does food insecurity actually mean? What does yeah, that, absolutely. What does that mean? So broadly speaking, when we think about food insecurity and we are talking about it with people, we think about ha- lacking access to food or not having food within the household that meets um, sufficient needs. So whether that's access in terms of physically having the food or access about getting the food, it's really just not having the needs to get an an ample and a sufficient amount of food for you or your household. Got it. Okay, great. 
I want to bounce back to HIV. So tell us a little bit more about what HIV looks like in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely made strides since the beginning of the epidemic um, in the late 80s and early 90s. But even still in 2020, we had about 31,000 people in the United States who were diagnosed with HIV. And of those diagnosed with HIV, we're still seeing significant disparities. So among those, 70% were among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. 22% were among uh, people who identified as heterosexual, and 7% were among those uh, people who inject or use drugs. Currently in the United States, there are approximately 1.2 million people living with HIV. And while HIV diagnosis has decreased about 8% overall, there are still stark disparities with new HIV incidents. So we see a lot of new diagnosis, primarily among Black and Hispanic men who have sex with men, um, and among other disparate groups of people within the United States. So that's great to hear what HIV looks like uh, on a national level. How about closer to home? Can you talk a little bit about what HIV incidence or prevalence looks like either here in Buffalo or more broadly, maybe in Erie County? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's nice to contextualize what HIV or the work we're doing looks like in Buffalo and Erie County. So in 2020, Erie County had about 85 new HIV diagnosis, which is actually the highest number in the state outside of New York City. So, and those number of diagnoses in Erie County has decreased in 2018 and 19, but actually in 2020 was the first time it's actually increased. So among these new infections, we saw that 63% were among non-Hispanic Black persons, 69% were actually among people ages 13 to 34, and 58% were among men who have sex with men. So we see that the new number of new diagnoses and among the new diagnoses in Buffalo kind of represents and contextualizes onto the stats that we see at the national level as well. So that's actually really interesting to hear some of those 2020 uh, numbers, because that's when we entered the early years, early months of the pandemic. So talk a little bit about how, how may that have happened, right? I guess we might assume that HIV cases would have gone down and especially when, you know, the first few months or even the first half of 2020. What might explain that pattern you see? Yeah, so the the intersections between HIV incidents and COVID nineteen are complex and interrelated, and it's we're still working very hard to to figure out what those complexities are. But a lot of people have hypothesized that the COVID nineteen pandemic has led to decrease in HIV testing, which would increase. Um, not only the proportion of people who are diagnosed with HIV, but also decrease uh, what people we know as like know as people's statuses. So one of the major things of HIV prevention is knowing your HIV status. We know that one in seven people who are diagnosed with HIV were unaware of their status. So it's it's a lot of researchers hypothesize that that is a major contributor to what we see an increase in HIV incidents is that people weren't getting tested during the pandemic, but still engaging in risky sexual behaviors despite social distancing guidelines and the risk of contracting COVID-19. But because of that, and because health centers shifted gears towards uh, treating and maintaining COVID-19 infrastructure, there was less testing that was potentially available, or people just were not willing to go get tested. So a major hypothesis is that less testing led to more unknown cases of HIV, which led to greater incidents within 2020. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. So let's flip back to food insecurity. Can you give us a sense of what food food insecurity looks like uh, across the United States? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in 2021, about 90% of households were food secure. So they had adequate means to get the food that they need to support themselves. So that leaves about 10% or 11% of households that were food insecure at least sometime during the year. And this includes 3.8% or 5.1 million households that had very low food insecurity. So the lowest bracket that we can think of when we're measuring food insecurity is very low food insecurity, which is very severe, uh, severe lacking access to food or not having the ability to maintain the the nutrition that they needed to, to survive. And we also see that this is highly correlated to socioeconomic status. So 32 or 33 percent of households that were food insecure were among those with incomes below the federal poverty line and rates of food insecurity were substantially higher for single parent households and for black and Hispanic households as well. You mentioned socioeconomic factors. Can you talk a little bit about either maybe geopolitical or even other economic drivers of food insecurity? So right up, you know, it comes to mind is things like inflation, right? And how we see our grocery store bills going up. How do those changes 
you know, kind of differentially impact those who are food insecure? Yeah, absolutely. So when we think, I think when we think about affording food and affording groceries, the first thing we think about is income and inflation has definitely impacted what we can afford at the grocery store. I know even personally, when you go to the grocery store, eggs are significantly more expensive than what they used to be. But another factor that uh, plays a significant role in food insecurity or food security status is actually access and having transportation to get to these areas or get to areas that have adequate food for your family. We know that the historical ideas of redlining or making or potentially seg- or intentionally segregating areas has influenced where grocery stores go, not only here in Buffalo, but also across the United States. So one of the biggest factors that influence foods food insecurity is actually being able to have access to these grocery stores or and lacking transportation, or even not even perhaps lacking transportation, but someone may not want to have to take five buses and spend $4 just to get to the grocery store and then have to take that back. So access and transportation concerns plays a large role in food security and food insecurity status in the United States. Got it. it. Makes a lot of sense. Are there any other things that you want to share with us about food insecurity, just generally speaking? Um, I think it's also important to contextualize it within Buffalo as well. Mm-hmm. So in 2020, nearly 56,000 households or 12% of all households in the Buffalo Niagara community lacked equitable access to supermarkets because they lived outside the average walking distance from shopping. So that kind of goes back to this idea of lacking adequate transportation or access to grocery stores. And a lot of this is predominantly within black and brown neighborhoods that have been red lines by supermarkets and grocery stores so that these areas are politically and economically not able to fund or have their own grocery stores in these areas, which significantly impacts access for people who live in Buffalo communities that don't have a Tops or a Wegmans right next to them. So it's it's an issue on the national level, but it's also a significant issue that hits very close to home within our Buffalo community. Sure. Yeah. And I think maybe something that um, many of us might take for granted. Absolutely. For sure. Okay. So you've shared with us a lot about HIV prevention, HIV treatment, and then this kind of parallel research world for you with respect to nutrition and food insecurity. How about this intersection though, right? So talk to us a little bit about how HIV nutrition and food insecurity intersect. Yeah, I think when you first think about HIV and food, you're like, there's no relationship there, or it's hard to contextualize the relationship between the two. But there's actually a significant relationship between not only food and nutrition and HIV in terms of like the bio, biomedical and pharmacokinetic level, but also at the healthcare engagement level and at the more social ecological level as well. So first, we know that research has illustrated significantly higher prevalence of food insecurity among people living with HIV compared to the general population. So like I said earlier, it's estimated that about 10 to 11 percent of the uh, population in the U.S. experienced food insecurity in 2020. But we have cross-sectional and longitudinal data among people living with HIV that estimates food insecurity uh, rates and prevalence to be about 25% to 70%. So we see a significant disparity in food insecurity affecting people living with HIV compared to the general population. Then we also just see significant risk factors that increase the risk for food insecurity among people living with HIV. So we see behavioral and mental health concerns, illicit substance use, And socioeconomic factors like we discussed earlier, such as low income, unemployment, unstable housing, transportation, that all kind of compound and intersect together to significantly increase the risk of experience food food insecurity while living with HIV. Got it. Okay. I now want to hear a little bit more about this influence on HIV treatment and HIV prevention. So talk to us a little bit maybe about your own research of how food insecurity influences HIV treatment. Yeah, absolutely. So we know that um, among people living with HIV, food insecurity is uh, associated with lower odds of completing healthcare outcomes or just lower odds of greater health outcomes. So we know that that means lower CD4, CD4 cell counts or like HIV in the body, incomplete viral suppression. So people are having detectable HIV um, viral loads in their body, which has the potential to increase transmission. 
they have worse immunologic responses, so they're more likely to get sick easier, and they've increased opportunistic infections um, that are associated with HIV and AIDS as well, and poor uh, medication adherence. So those within, for people living with HIV and HIV treatment, all kind of interplay to make, to kind of influence health outcomes for people living with HIV that kind of decrease one's ability to maintain and achieve viral suppression, which is that last stage of the HIV care continuum, which we were, are trying to do. So I know that you do qualitative studies and you interview people living with HIV. Can you give us maybe some examples of how this actually plays out? So you're making these connections between food insecurity and you're talking about connections to treatment engagement, but how does it actually work in someone's day-to-day life? Yeah, absolutely. So I recently just had a paper published in Tropical Medicine and Infectious Disease that looked at the influence of COVID-19 on HIV care engagement among people living with HIV. And my sample was 25 people living with HIV across New York State. The majority were food insecure. A lot of them talked about how the pandemic and food insecurity influenced their social determinants of health, so particularly income, housing, and transportation, and how that led to decreased engagement and care. People talked about just how food insecurity in general was significantly impacted by COVID-19 and how that led to increased periods of time where they didn't have food and they didn't they, that increased their depression or their anxiety and they physically felt weak and they weren't able to go to their doctor's appointments or they weren't able to take their medication and. It was a a lot of our participants just talked about how when you don't have food, the last thing on your mind is taking care of your other health needs. My main priority is going to find or do something so that I can eat dinner for the day, but I'm not going, the last thing on my mind is going to talk to my doctor or to take my medications. And a lot of these medications, people don't like to take on an empty stomach. So if they don't have food, they're not going to take it. So, mm-hmm. And that's a really good point about how the medicine actually works in their body. And if, the, if you need to take it with food, but uh, food isn't available to you, uh, you can see how that affects the way people uh, make choices about their, their uh, taking their medicine. Absolutely. Okay. Are there other ways that the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced food insecurity and how people living with HIV kind of manage their illness? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a unique finding in our study was this idea of social support or re- support from other people within a person's social network. And despite other studies that have found like significant social isolation and decreased social support among people living with HIV during the COVID pandemic, we found or our participants described how during the pandemic, they actually had increased social support from families and friends and loved ones and clinicians that kind of helped them with receiving these material needs. So in times where they were had insecurities, such as housing, food, these people kind of came up and served to help them get food or to provide them housing or to give them the resources so that they were able to get a meal for the day. So that was a, a unique finding that we found that kind of really drives home this idea of how social support acts as intrinsic motivation for engagement across the care continuum, despite the pandemic going on. You mentioned the social support and you talked about family and friends, but then you also talked a little bit about healthcare providers or other um, maybe social service providers. Talk a little bit more about how non-family members, non-friends can really help with uh, tackling the food insecurity challenges that people living with HIV might experience. Yeah, absolutely. So in our study, we found that a lot of participants got emotional and informational support um, from their from their healthcare providers or case managers and counselors. And that emotional support of encouragement to continue with their care despite these challenges really became internalized among people. And uh, participants really felt that their providers cared for their well-being outside of their HIV. So that kind of became internalized for people to stay motivated to engage in in their care and take their medication. But on the opposite side, it also made them more comfortable to talk about other uh, needs that they had. So a lot of our participants were in unstable housing, did not have incomes or lost incomes due to the pandemic, or even um, didn't have food to eat. So a lot of case managers, counselors, and even healthcare providers and clinicians provided resources that allowed these per, our participants to go within the community and find maybe a hot meal for the day or help them find, give them the information to a shelter that would allow them to stay there for the night. So the social support expands beyond one's loved one to include the healthcare sector as well. And that's a really important thing to drive home when we're thinking about uh, HIV care engagement as well. So you're a public health 
practitioner, you're a public health researcher. How can other public health researchers and practitioners work to really reduce food insecurity among people living with HIV? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's really, when I think about it, I think about the about approaching it from like the social ecological model, um, thinking about the interpersonal, the community, and the policy levels of that. So really leveraging that social support to ensure timely and successful engagement. So we know that HIV stigma is still very, runs very rampant within our society, and that is unfortunately the case within families as well. So ensuring that uh, we can reduce HIV stigma within the community to ensure that people have social support when they are or if they're diagnosed with HIV, um, to ensure that healthcare providers have the information to help them stay engaged. And then also just leveraging health policies and um, public health infrastructure. So one thing to think about is increasing um, supplemental nutrition assistance program or SNAP benefits. So we um, have seen in the COVID-19 pandemic that some SNAP benefits just may not be enough when combating with HIV and another crisis such as COVID-19. So increasing those benefits so that people have more money and aren't stretching the dollar at the end of the month, but then also amplifying strategies that increase HIV care engagement um, such as um, programs like Data to Care, which is an HIV surveillance program. So they use healthcare provider and health uh, department models to identify people who are engaged in care but aren't virally suppressed. So what is that disconnect between being engaged in care, but you're still having detectable HIV in your body? And it's really taking that Data to Care program and stretching it beyond the healthcare or like the siloed idea of medicine and looking at what other material needs may be um, impeding someone's successful engagement. Perhaps it's housing, perhaps it's food, perhaps it's income that's uh, inhibiting someone from taking their medication. So they're showing up for their appointments, but if you're not taking your medication, you're not gonna be virally suppressed. But if that's because of income, if that's because of food, integrating those programs so that uh, these programs not only have EPI data and surveillance data, but also are able to look at these more social socio-structural factors that impact care and have solutions or, ref, or abilities to engage and uh, intervene on them. Great. You mentioned stigma earlier about people living with HIV. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on what you hope the general public would <laughs> know about people living with HIV who experience food insecurity or maybe some misperceptions or misunderstandings. What can, how can we do a better job of helping to uh, kind of uh, demystify HIV or work with uh, respect to food insecurity among people living with HIV? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what you said, like demystifying HIV is, is like an important thing that we still need to strive for, not only within our work, but also as a society as a whole. And I think what's really important is that people living with HIV are the same people, same as everyone else. They're just living with a disease. It's the And now with the, the antiretroviral therapies and engagement in care, um, we're looking and treating HIV as a chronic disease that's manageable and uh, manageable with proper medication and care, similar to what we do with diabetes. So shifting the mindset from HIV being this infectious disease, which it still is, but to a more chronic manageable disease um, is really important for the community to think about because back there was a lot of myths that came out within the early times of the HIV epidemic. And I still think some of those are prevalent within the communities, but not because of ignorance, but because people just don't know. Mm -hmm. So really working with our communities, our us as public health practitioners, researchers, health departments, really getting out there to inform the community about HIV, make sure everyone knows their status despite their risk factors. Mm -hmm. Because the more we do it, the more we'll normalize it and the more we'll, we'll start to treat HIV as a chronic disease, such as diabetes, instead of this death sentence that it was uh, 20, 30 years ago. How about next steps for you, Jake? Where do you see your future research about this intersection with uh, food and nutrition, food insecurity within the realm of HIV? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So my um, my goal is to really focus on starting to take this, this data that we have and translating it into intervention work. So we have all this longitudinal and cross-sectional data that shows that food insecurity and nutrition-related and dietary-related stuff is much lower among people living with HIV, but what can we do about it within our community? So really looking at more like a social ecological approach to addressing some of these disparities within the communities 
making and sustaining interventions within the communities um, is really what I strive to do. And I think that's how we're going to combat some of these issues. Um, So yeah, those are kind of my next steps. Great. Are there any other final concluding thoughts you'd like to share with us, Jake? No, I think we covered them all. Great. This has been another episode of Buffalo HealthCast. Thank you again to our guest, Jacob Bleasdale, for taking the time to speak with us today. Nicole Clem is our faculty consultant. Sarah Robinson is our production assistant. Omar Brown is our sound editor. And our theme music was written and recorded by Sung Min Shin of the UB Music Department. My name is Sarah Mona Prisvilla, your host and writer for this week's episode. Thank you for listening and tune in next time to learn more about health equity in Buffalo, the United States, and around the globe.